I just had seven weight grades came up. All right, so let's jump in to our um, chapter on weight loss. A lot of people think about weight loss and um, they think, you know, the yo-yo diet. You see a lot of yo-yo diet. It. Um, let's use an example. Say maybe in high school, um, you decide you want to lose weight for prom or an athletic event. Maybe you're in weights or something. So you do a lot of weight loss, and then you gain that. Uh, early 20s, same thing. It's that weight gain, uh, take it off, what, gain it back. It gets harder and harder as it goes. And um, there's a lot of hormonal control in weight maintenance. The bad thing is what we're seeing a lot in America is we all have ideas of what people should look like based on commercials. We have magazines, we have um, things, movies. We all have this distorted idea of how we're supposed to look. It's kind of like the twins, Mary-Kate and Ashley Olson, right? Um, one of the twins developed a psychological disorder. You guys remember? Which one was it? Was it Mary-Kate? Y'all know who I'm talking about? Full House? Yeah. They developed anorexia and nervosa. Karen Carpenter, you guys are too young to know who Karen Carpenter is. Carpenter's. Yes. <laughs> There's two of us. I'm not too young. Yes, I remember. I'm not too young. And she developed anorexia and nervosa, mm -hmm. and she died mm -hmm. from um, heart, heart failure. So we're going to talk about anorexia bulimia today. Um, but what we're seeing is a lot of unhealthy lifestyles, whether it's this yo-yo up and down dieting, whether it's anorexia, nervosa, whether it's bulimia, uh, binge eating, whatever it is, we're seeing a lot of bad trends in America. All right, other countries, they're not, they're starting to see some obesity. Any country that has an our companies in it, like McDonald's, KFC, they're starting to see obesity now. I told you about my daughter that was in Uganda, in Kenya. Um, they have a lot of uh, food insecurity in Uganda and Kenya but they still want to buy a Coke from America. So their dollars, because it's a status thing, their dollars are used to buy soda. We send it over there, we're pushing it, we're advertising it, we're promoting it, see how it goes. And they're like, they want, they want to spend their money on soda. So instead of putting money for the, you know, food that the family might eat, it might like things that are cheaper, maybe starchy things. Do we see that in America? If you look in grocery carts, you see a lot of soda. And people, I don't have enough money for food. Well, if you have money for soda, could it buy a few apples or some a bag of carrots? And so a lot of it's, we're seeing a lot of um, not so great trends. And we develop a taste for sugar early on and those carry on through our life, and, and especially the, the sugar-fat combo thing. So this is what is going on with obesity. If we took it backwards to the 1960s, we'd even see less obesity in America. But if you look at the, the little scale at the bottom, you'll see the percentage of obesity in America. And has it gone up or has it gone down? What do you think? Up. Uh, is Texas, Oklahoma, and a lot of those southern states in the in the bad range? Yeah, yes. you can see, yeah. And it's been progressing. See how it's been progressing over time? All right, so this is your first think time on it. What was the percent obesity? I'll take you back to that slide. For Oklahoma, for 1990, 1999, I'm, I'm minus a nine there. 2010, what has happened and why? All right, y'all ready to go back? So the first one was 1990, 1999, 2010. It's your first think time. So tell me what the percentage is first in 1990, 1999, and 2010. Got a little grid at the bottom to help you on this um, little um, graph. Tell me what's going on, what the percentages are, and why. A good question isn't the why question. So what's the percentage for Oklahoma? That's our state, right? When you guys are gonna be like, you know, probably. 
So what percentage? You may have to move to the front, you know, go up to where you can see the screen to read it. So Why do you think this is going on? Just based on what you've learned and what you know. Why do you think this is changing? Wouldn't you love to see it go the other way? Of course, you guys are going to have jobs forever if it doesn't, right? You're going to need more health care workers, right? Although, if your population dies off, you'll have less patients. You think about it, if this trend keeps going, and they're predicting it to keep going up and up and up, they're expecting like 50% type 2 diabetes by like, um, in like seven years. Half of the country, type 2 diabetes. Is type 2 diabetes obesity related? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, do you think people, if they're starting to, sh we're starting to see obesity in children, which we're seeing a lot of, we're seeing two type 2 diabetes in children now, even 19 years old. Um, I know a dietitian, she was working with a, a really young girl, she was 10, I think, and she had um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and type 2 diabetes. This is a real deal. So patients may not be living until their 70s and 80s with so this trend going on, right? So we're going to have to do something or that it's just going to keep going. Oklahoma, we said, was in the top five, right? Number one for heart disease. That's terrible, isn't it? So we're losing patients, right? So severe, severe um, trends going on that we're going to have to halt or our whole population is really uh, becoming very unhealthy. Okay, so you guys have a chance to, to maybe turn the tide and send it the other direction. So instead of going this direction, what could we do? Instead of increasing the percentage numbers, what could we do to bring the trend back, going back the other way? We could eat healthier. We could eat healthier. Exercise more. Exercise more. Absolutely. There's lots of stuff we can do. Yeah, absolutely. We could do a lot of things, can we? It's just doing it. Yeah, it's doing it. Yeah. And get up and get moving. So we promote a lot of unhealthy behavior. During Wellness Week, I'm creating a Facebook page. I borrowed it from the Choctaw Nation. It's called The Walking Warriors. And they post their healthy behaviors on their Facebook. And you get so many points and you win prizes. And that's why we're gonna, you're going to win prizes. So it's eating, exercising, all those things that play a role in healthy lifestyles, okay? So when we talk about this energy balance, if we're taking in the same amount of calories that we're expending, we're in actual equilibrium or balance. 
If we're taking in too many calories, right, like sitting on the couch eating potato chips, right, that's what we call it, um, we get the term couch potato, and uh, we get positive energy balance. We're taking in more calories than we can burn, and if we're using more calories than our body needs, then we go into negative energy balance. That's how we lose weight. Right, now showing that, and athletes sometimes they have to eat a lot of calories to um, prevent from losing a lot of lots of calories and weight. Okay, so what is positive energy balance? What causes it? Negative energy balance. And what causes it? It's on page three twenty one. Negative energy balance. Three twenty one. What is positive energy balance? What causes it? What is negative energy balance? So what is positive energy balance, what causes it, and negative energy balance, what causes it? I used to go visit with the athletes that were wanting to become coaches, and I'd always talk to them. And like, when you're an athlete, you can almost eat anything and not gain weight, especially if you're expending a lot of energy. But what do you do? You ever see very many skinny coaches? No. So they get these food habits that they can eat whatever they want, right? But typically, when they get into coaching, they're not really expending much energy. In fact, you always say a donut and a cup of coffee, right? And so a lot of um, athletes can be, as they become inactive, can really lead to a lot of weight gain, again, because they're starting some habits and things. And so you really have to be careful on this thing, too. All right. So um, energy intake, we can determine by the calories. You guys know how to calculate calories now. We've learned a lot of that. And um, we talked about a bomb calorimeter that's used to actually use in temperature to determine calories of food. You guys, we talked about a bomb calorie where they burn up the food and the measure of the amount of change in the increase in the temperature of the water, all right? That's what it looks like, so you can see it. And then for um, patients, we can ca calculate their basal metabolic rate, the, the amount of energy that they're using in a resting state. And that Harris Benedict is taking it the next step. What is the energy they're expending, as well as are they going to need extra calories to heal? That's taken at the clinical level. So our book talks about how to calculate our basal metabolic rate, which is like the hair spin dick, but we're going the next step. We're calculating the energy. Are they in the bed or out of the bed? Are they um, healing from certain, certain types of wounds like broken bones and burns, or are they going to need more calories? So there's different factors that increase or um, decrease the basal metabolic rate. So typically, who has the highest basal metabolic rate, men or women? Men, because they have more lean muscle mass, yes. So young men in particular, right, you guys have the best. That's why you see athletes that are super thin, and again, they get older, there you go, right? So they're, they're used to the, having that great uh, resting basal metabolic rate. And um, if you smoke, it increases your basal metabolic rate. I don't encourage anybody to smoke, right? Um, 
but also thyroid hormones help to set our basal metabolic rate. So if our thyroid hormones, T3 and T4 are low, our basal metabolic rate is going to be low. We'll talk about that one a little bit in the role of iodine and needing those to make the hormones. Uh, our body temperature, if we're shivering and we're cold, we're using more energy. Do y'all know that? We're giving off heat. Uh, or if we're having fever, so if your patient has a lot of fever with a flu, that increases their basal metabolic rate. They may need more calories during that period of time, even though they may or may not want to eat. Um, recent exercise increases your um, basal metabolic rate. So if you exercise every day, that up helps to up your basal metabolic rate, which is what we always encourage. Exercise plays a huge role in helping increase our basal metabolic rate, because the more lean muscle mass we have, the greater our basal metabolic rate. And then after you get after 30, our basal metabolic rate goes down, especially after 40 and as it continues on, we get more fat. And then of course, low thyroid hormones cause a lowering of basal metabolic rate. And so physical activity plays a big role on the amount of extra calories that we need. And then we talk about the thermic effect of food, which is called the sales tax of energy. It's the amount of energy to digest and absorb your food. It's about five to 10% of your energy. So if you have food that's complicated to digest and absorb, like fiber food, it's using a little more energy. That's why you should eat more fiber foods. Just one good reason. If we could up our LDLA, you see brown fat, it gives off more heat and you could burn more calories. All right, so this is just showing you how much of the calories are burned on the different things. So basal metabolic rate, you use the majority of your energy, add your physical activities and then your thermic effect of food. All right, so we talked about all those. By the way, if you have greater body mass, you have a higher basal metabolic rate. So taller people, unfortunately. Um, fasting and starvation, this is what a lot of people don't know. If they're dieting, you get to a point, if you're not taking in enough calories, it'll slow your basal metabolic rate. Your body acts, it's a protective mechanism for your body. A lot of people don't know that. So, plays a row. Um, how we determine when we do direct calorimetry, uh, you put them in a chamber, a room, and you measure the amount of the heat and the change in the water around the room. Indirect um, calorimetry is, you've seen those little exercise bikes that you hook them up to the things you breathe into. It's measuring the amount of oxygen used and the CO2 expended. That's how much um, ATP, right? CO2 is a byproduct of ATP metabolism. And then um, doubly labeled water is also used in the amount of oxygen used. Um, but this is an expensive mechanism. And then estimated energy requirements is a calculation that we can use. This is on page 324, 325. And, um, Again, kind of similar to Harris Benedict, and we're going to use this one a little bit later to determine how many calories we need. This is the one that the MyPlate uses, the EER. Okay, so things that regulate us eating or not eating. What's the difference between hunger versus appetite? Hunger, yeah. Mm -hmm. so physiological yeah, when your stomach growls, it goes brrrr, right? versus your eyes, you go, ooh, that looks delicious, and you've already eaten, that's appetite, right? Yeah, hunger, you're really hungry. Hunger, it means you listen to your body cues. How many of us listen to our body cues? Not so much. So we have a little gland, and it's, a, it's in our brain, it's a little organ that helps to regulate both thirst and hunger. We talked about that today. Can anyone remember where that region of the brain is? Remember writing it down in anatomy? The, I heard some. Did y'all think of it? Oh, the hypothalamus. Yeah, so the hypothalamus both regulate hunger and thirst, right? So sometimes we think we're really, really hungry when actually we're probably thirsty. We're dehydrated. The American population is dehydrated. Did y'all know that? We're very deep. We don't drink near enough water. So we get the cues and we're like, oh, our body's saying we need to eat. When actually, what should we do? Drink. And so the first thing we should do 
and this is a really helpful way to help to lose weight, to help regulate our body weight, is to drink more. And when my kids were small, I always kept water down so they could drink, 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 because kids get really dehydrated and they forget to drink. Older people forget to drink. We all forget to drink. So we need to drink. Are you getting thirsty right now when we're talking about it? Some of you are. Yeah, you're getting accused like, I am thirsty. And we turn it off. We're like, no, we're not thirsty. We're hungry. All right, let's eat a snack. Let's get in the vending machine and eat a snack. So our hypothalamus helps to regulate both. So sometimes we need to listen to those body cues, but we need to drink first. Always get a drink of water or something first. And then appetites when we watch those Brahms commercials and we want to go get a big Sunday. <laughs> yeah, those are killer. And then satiety means we're what? Full. All right, that's listening to those cues, and our body said, nope, you're full. All right, and so we say, we're done. So tidy means we're satisfied. So there's a lot of things that help to regulate our food intake. There's hormones and that play a row, uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine keep us from being as hungry. We call those uh, hormones fight or flight hormones. Cortisol, the stress hormone, makes us eat more. You've heard about that cortisol commercial, the guy causing the abdominal fat and uh, plays a big role. Then there's hormones called ghrelin and leptin. And so ghrelin tells us we're hungry and we need to eat more. Have y'all ever seen that one, ghrelin and leptin? And then leptin helps regulate and keep us from eating as much. And protein foods help to activate leptin. For a long time, they thought we could just give people leptin shots and they'd quit overeating. It didn't work. When they did it, they found out some people may not be sensitive to that hormone, and that may be why it's not working right. So all these things play a role. Blood sugar levels play a role to stimulate um, us to eat more. So uh, all these play a role. Okay, and as blood glucose go up, it causes quit eating. All right, so what is the difference between hunger and appetite? And give personal examples. What is the difference between hunger versus appetite? So our hypothalamus in our brain, right, those little satiety cells tell us when to eat and when not to eat. And if we listen to those signals, and then we talked about the role of the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. And then this regulation can be altered by chemical surgery or cancer, okay? So lots of times there's um, drugs that they can use to suppress appetites. 
uh, serotonin in particular has been pretty helpful. Epinephrine. What's the downside of using epinephrine though, which is like the sympathetic autonomic nervous system that we just talked about that tells you to quit eating? And we call it fight or flight hormone, epinephrine, norepinephrine. What would be the downside of using it? Have you ever heard of ephedra, the drug called ephedra? What happened when people were taking ephedra? Yeah, fin fin. Yeah, what does it mean? They sleep. They can't sleep. That's one of the fun. There's one though that it increases your rate of depression. Yeah, it can. Yeah. Heart rate. Can they have a heart attack and die? Yeah, they have people had heart attacks, so they had to pull the drug, some of those drugs. Yeah, and so sometimes they have to be carefully monitored by doctors. So you want to be really careful. Um, that you're not taking some of those over-the-counter drugs. We talked about Ally. Do you guys remember Ally? Uh, Orlistat is another one that keeps you from absorbing the fat. It goes right into the large intestine and out. It binds the fat, but it also binds the fat-soluble vitamins. So you can be depleted in your fat-soluble vitamins. So those can be bad because you get fat in the stool, right? And we said uh, anal leakage is not a fun thing to have. <laughs> remember us talking about that? I had a high with Trump friend. He was doing ally. He said that was a bad thing to do while you're on duty. <laughs> bad story, but you know, important to know, you're right, when you're talking to um, different patients. We're going to talk about bariatric surgery here in just a bit, too. So that's just showing you. Um, you can see the thalamus, the little arrow is wrong. The hypothalamus is right below it. It shifted on the PowerPoint. Okay, so it's right below the thalamus. So it helps regulate. Also, we have something called stretch receptors. So in our stomach, this is a really weird thing. They've done studies where they weighed the amount of food that people consume. They would like have people um, go through a food line and they'd weigh their food before they ate and after they ate, and they did it daily for weeks. And they said that people eat the same weight of food almost every day. No matter what they ate, they almost ate the same weight. Is that weird to think about? So we get used to how our stomach feels in that stretch mode, right? Have you ever done that when, you, when you've been ill and then your stomach is very small and then you eat a little bit and you're like, I feel too full right now. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So we eat almost the same weight every day. So if we ate a things like a big huge salad with a lot of fluid with some protein with a high satiety factor, then we would feel full quicker, right? And that's why they tell you eat a salad before your meal, right? Drink water before your meal. Drink a lot, right? All right, so what are factors that regulate hunger? List the hormones and regulatory factors. And this is all on page 326, 327. There's a big discussion on that on 326. Three twenty six, three twenty seven. So, what are some factors that regulate hunger? List the hormones and regulatory factors. So, list some things that can regulate. Either to slow it or speed it up. some factors that help to regulate hunger.
Yeah, someone mentioned um, antidepressant drugs. Um, some of those antidepressant drugs can really make a patient hungry and they'll gain a lot of weight, right? Mm-hmm. Or exogenous cortisol for cancer and stuff. So, um, epilepsy. Yeah, epilepsy. Mm-hmm. They, uh, my friend, she takes, she got on one and it made her sick. Mm-hmm. She had to have it. And so then she had to get on one to kind of like, it's supposed to make you lose weight. Uh-huh. The medication, yeah. yeah. They even found out even your adipose cells communicate with your brain. They produce a, it's not a hormone, but it's like a chemical messenger that tell when the cells are getting smaller to make you want to eat more. Is that crazy? It's rigged. I know, it's rigged. Your body's rigged, yeah. Tricking your body cells. So let's talk about our adipose cells. They're also called our fat cells, right? And they increase most rapidly during later years and early puberty. This is where we see a lot of weight gain now in America is um, kids are becoming less active. And this is where the fat cell numbers increase. Once we get our cell numbers, they're there for life, typically speaking. They haven't learned how to control those numbers yet. So they're easy to feel. So even though they shrink, they're easy to fill back up. And if they're communicating with brain telling you to fill it or slowing your metabolic rate, you know, you're fighting against something that's very difficult, okay? So we know that the fat cell numbers increase in time of positive energy balance. And this is called hyperplastic obesity, meaning hyperplasia, increase in cell numbers. And this is just showing you how they go. Not only do they increase in numbers during childhood, they can also, of course, increase in size. But once we get our cell numbers and we get older, then they can just keep increasing in size and size and size. We have almost unlimited ability to store fat in our body. You can see people going up 700, 800 pounds, right? We almost have unlimited ability. Is that incredible to think about how our body does that? So not only can we, if they continue to increase in size, 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 at some point they'll go ahead and divide again. But typically we see a lot in late childhood, early adolescence. Okay? So again, with weight loss, the size of the cell shrinks, but not the number. And that's what we're fighting against. This is a tough battle sometimes. All right. And so what's some things that influence what we eat? So we talked about the chemical hormonal regulators. What's some other things that regulate it? What about our parents? Do they play a big role? Grandparents? Like grandma, eat just eat pie every night with your you know, eat some kind of dessert. My grandmother, she made dessert every single day. Every day. We had some kind of sweet dessert, you know, around. So we had Everything you can imagine, from donuts to pies to cakes to cinnamon rolls. That was her way to love on us. And she was a great cook. You couldn't tell her no. If you ate one piece, she'd get you to eat another one. She was a wonderful woman, right? So we play a big role. And if you guys have kids, you guys get to act as the gatekeepers in your home. I have to act as the gatekeeper. I'm the one that buys groceries in my house. So I get to decide what snacks are in the house, right? So right now we're working on um, some things to try to keep those snack things down, right? All right. Um, So we talked about body mass index. We did, there's a table on 329, and we learned how to calculate it. And we talked about what is a healthy BMI versus underweight. Can there also be some dangers with being underweight? We see that a lot with older patients. What's some dangers of being underweight? We always think of being overweight as bad. Pardon? Organ failure, absolutely, yeah. What about recovery from illness? Yeah, so sometimes, especially as a patient start getting older and older, kind of being on the outside edge of healthy weight is pretty good. Now when you're young, you know, maintaining that healthy body weight, but again, BMI is an arbitrary table, all right? Um, Bone mass plays a row, muscle mass plays a row, so it's not an end-all-do-all, yes? Why is it that when some patients get older, 
They start to shrink, don't they? So what do you think happens to their muscle mass as they get older? Atrophies. Yeah, that lean muscle mass. It atrophies. And they're almost, and they're losing bone mass, aren't they? And their skin becomes thin. The collagen goes down. And they're almost shrinking, right? Their skin becomes like babies, very transparent, very prone to, yeah, get, they get really, really small, don't they? Yeah. In fact, they say with older adults, it's kind of better to be on the kind of the top, not overweight, overweight, but a little bit, just for protective for in case the illness comes along. Not super overweight, but just kind of a little bit. Yeah, they're seeing that like the 70s and stuff. Of course, when you're fighting heart disease and so forth, you want to be careful with that. So we see our range of tables. So obese is greater, BMI greater than 30, overweight um, 25 to 29.9, and then healthy weight 18.5 to um, 24.9, and then underweight is less than 18.5, okay? So I want you guys to do the BMIs real quick. So tell me what the BMIs are for obesity, and overweight, healthy weight, and underweight. So what's the range of BMIs? And again, this is not the end all do all. We talked about a lot of athletes have BMIs in the 30s, maybe even 40. But again, weight circumference, that's what we're really looking at. So what's a BMI for underweight? Overweight, normal body weight, and obesity. Underweight, overweight, healthy weight, and obesity. Doctors still use these tables a lot. And again, we learned how to calculate last week, so if you guys need help after class, I'll help you again on calculations. Underweight, healthy weight, overweight, and obesity. By the way, there's a new category um, for morbidly obese is what they call it because they're in risk of dying uh, over uh, BMI greater than 40 is really high. Okay, and their risk from dying from surgery. Surgery gets really complicated and given the anesthesia, the patient recovering after surgery, um, delivering babies. So there's a lot of complications uh, as we get into obese and then we get into the over 40, the morbidly obese. It becomes really, really dangerous. Uh, a lot of health care risk associated with that. All right. So they can do some things in measuring body fat content. This is on page 330. Skin fold thickness, where they measure the amount of fat under the skin with calipers, uh, bioelectrical impedance. Um, the electrical current will move through water and electrolytes that's in muscle quicker than it will adipose, so that can be measured. Um, underwater weighing uh, is one thing. And a bod pod is showing an example of body volume of air displacement. It's called a bod pod. There's a good picture on page 330. And then DEXA. We use DEXA a lot, dual x-ray absorptometry, for bone density. And they found when they were doing bone density studies, they're like, whoa, we can do percent body fat. It's super accurate on percent body fat. Okay? And that's just showing you how to do it. That's just showing you the DEXA thing. And the little bod pod, electrical impedance. A lot of the little scales that you can get now have bioelectrical impedance. So then we talk about how your body fat is distributed. If it's upper body, we call it android shape. That's apple shape. That's the most dangerous of all. Okay. So this is where you store the fat around the middle. So this is just showing you what it looks like. So we always just think about it right here in the belly, but it's everywhere. 
so it's around our organs, our liver can be fatty, um, surrounding, I mean we store body fat everywhere. So at the same time when we're trying to lose weight, can we just lose it around the middle? You know how they always show those exercise things? You can just lose it around the middle. We don't get to choose where we lose it, do we? No. no. That's false advertising, isn't it? But you can see this guy has abdominal obesity, which is the most risky? Lower body adipose, where we call it pear shape, or upper android, where it's around the middle. Upper, yeah, right around the middle. That's why waist circumference is so important. So if a woman has a, a waist circumference greater than 35 inches and a man greater than 40, it increases their risk dramatically for heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and early death. Okay, so women greater than 35 inches around the waist and men greater than 40. They, I saw a new study that they were doing with children because, again, you hate to get body and uh, dysmorphic uh, I, uh, dysmorphism in kids' minds about how their body shape. So then now they're doing neck circumference with children and seeing a good relationship there, which I think is, is healthier. Yeah. So, so if that abdominal fat's around the middle, it's released right into the liver. So usually they'll have their liver enzymes will be off the chart. Their lipids may be off the chart. Um, Hypertension, so again, we really want to watch that. Okay, and that's just showing you. Um, in studies where they've looked at genetics with the identical twins, this is kind of odd. Identical twins were raised apart, typically weigh the same. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they're also in the, Isn't that weird? Like the same, career. same career, yeah, sometimes that's true, isn't it? So they think we may have a set point that we have a set point of being a certain way. And then, of course, there's an environment relevant. So they say, is it nature or is it nurture? So if you had a family history of obesity, heart disease, and diabetes, do you have to just give up and say, that's my life? No. You say, I'm going to fight that thing. I'm going to fight it with all that I have. I'm going to exercise every day. I'm going to watch what I eat. I'm going to eliminate soda, right? And I want to fight it. In fact, one of the instructors that used to work here she uh, was overweight all through elementary school, high school. She got to college, and she found aerobic exercise, and now she's an exercise guru. If y'all know Loma Messix that teaches the exercise class, she's riding her bicycle. She rides across Oklahoma on a bicycle. Mm -hmm. She's close to 70. Mm -hmm. She's amazing. So you don't have to settle for that. She said everyone in her family has heart disease and diabetes. Yeah, you don't have to settle for that. So if you have genetics that aren't great, fight it. All right, and then there's also some disorders. Uh, uh, the Prader-Willis syndrome, uh, where they actually have to loft the refrigerator down, loft the cabinets. Um, again, it's not getting those cues, and, the, and that's a genetic disorder, okay? So sound weight loss. We see a lot of, Dr. Oz is always talking about crazy stuff. So each um, pound of adipose tissue is equal to 3,500 kilocalories, right? So you're going to have to eliminate about 500 calories a day to lose one pound of weight. Quite a bit, right? So you have to get up and go and really watch your diet to make a difference, all right? And so problem behaviors, if you notice, like if you're sad, you overeat. A lot of people eat when they're sad. They eat when they're happy, right? Uh, eat when they're watching TV, eat when they're on the computer, or they have friends that snack all the time, right? Check your snacks, watch your snacks, and do something else instead. They call it chain-breaking behavior. So our book talks about it at the last part of the chapter. It talks about breaking the habits of things. So get up and walk instead of taking a snack. Um, this is on page 339. Go, go do something else. Uh, if you know in the evening that's when your problems are, find a new hobby, knit, do needlepoint, do something to break some habits. But exercise alone will help to um, slow the appetite too, so that's always a good thing. Okay. So um, driving through. Have you guys seen the sriracha in the French fries? That people eat less French fries if you dip it in sriracha sauce. Have y'all seen that? Y'all know what sriracha? All right, here you go. Which body type is more dangerous, apple shape or pear? 
apple chip, apple shape or pear. Could you do a food diary too? Does that tell you a lot about what you're doing? Yeah, and you're working with patients. That's really good. All right, so um, give me two ideas of some chain-breaking um, behavior changes that you could make to alter some behaviors. What are two chain-breaking uh, things that you could do to alter behavior? That snack thing. <coughs> what are two chain breaking behaviors? What are two chain breaking behaviors that you could do to alter um, or ch chain breaking activities you could do to break? Um, behaviors like snacking and things. What are things you could do? We talked about chain breaking. If you need some help, it's on page 339 and uh, 340, there's all sorts of good ideas. You guys working uh, with patients, these have wonderful ideas. Now, our book suggests eating a low-fat, high-carb diet. There's a lot of discussion right now out on that. I say leave it alone, right? This is what our book says. Uh, protein has the highest satiety factor of any of the energy uh, foods that we consume. So if you eat protein with a meal, are you likely to, to stay full longer? Yes. So we see this a lot with kids. If they're only eating cereal and milk in the morning, low-fat milk, by, you guys know, if you have cereal and low-fat milk, are you hungry in like an hour? Yeah. Starving, especially if it's things like fruity pebbles or something, a lot of sugar. You're gonna digest it, it's gonna go fast. So you give them some protein, and it may make you feel fuller, all right? Um, and so breakfast, people who eat breakfast, typically they're not as hungry at lunch so they don't overeat at lunch so they say that's important and then a food journal and a physical activity plan for every day and even shopping I always say don't go in right stay on the outside don't go in <laughs> you know what that means in a grocery store don't go in hungry don't go in hungry <laughs> but even if you go in hungry always stay to the outside of the store now if you Fruits, get to the checkout yeah, what's on the outside? Fruits, vegetables, and yeah. meat. At some point, they're going to move everything to the middle, aren't they? Mix this up. To, yeah. All the junk stuff's in the middle, isn't it? Now, the checkout's your killer, right? But if you don't go in, you're just eating fruits and vegetables, right? You can pick up a little bit of grains, yeah. All right, so that's a, a really thing. And don't pick up the snack foods, and you won't be tempted. If you do, pick snacks that are healthy. And, and put them in little Ziplocs, kind of monitor your portion size. Okay. Uh, anything on fad weight loss plans, there's a lot of them in our book. Um, page 343, Atkins, um, Macrobiotic. There's a new one every single day, right? All right, so things to watch out for. Those that promise rapid weight loss, uh, with Atkins, you're losing a lot of water. You also may be losing lean muscle mass. Um, but for some people, a little bit adding more protein may help get you off carbs a little bit. I've seen some help, especially people who are um, type 2 diabetes. Um, those that don't encourage behavior change. You ever see on the commercials, they're like, eat all the brownies you want, right? That's a bad idea. Or if they see you food in these little packages and they taste bad, and then you're like, I'm not going to stand it. So it has to be something that's sustainable. I say start small and work out. Get rid of soda. Now, lose, you could lose 10 pounds getting rid of soda. Get rid of soda, drink more water, add more fiber, stay the outside of the grocery store, exercise every day, right? Every day. 
at least 30 to 60 minutes. But all of these diets um, tend to lead to the up and down um, weight change that happens and that can really affect your cholesterol levels too. It can cause your LDL cholesterol to go up and your HDL cholesterol to go down. All right. So make sure it's maintained and psychological things that are going on. All right, let's move on into bariatric surgery. Um, it's not showing you the banana, which is another type of sleeve around the stomach. It's called the banana. So gastric bypass is the odors. We call it stomach stapling. Um, so the, the large part of both the small intestine and the stomach it's just a little tiny pouch about the size of a shot glass. Um, gastric banding, where they go in there and wrap the upper portion of the stomach. Again, you're only gonna get about a shot glass or so worth of space in there, so you can eat small portions. Um, and then sleeve, again, another type of stapling, and now they can go in and they can actually fit a sleeve around the stomach. Um, the thing is that you have to worry about is the patient getting enough nutrients or if they get sick, and there's also some side effects from the surgery. Um, with the gastric banding, they think this one is less dangerous. They can actually add more saline, increase the size of the stomach pouch. But what's some things that we can't do with any types of these bariatric surgeries? This is all on page 346, 347. What's some things you can't do? You can't eat fast foods? Nope. Sugary foods, yeah. What happens with sugary foods? You know, it's called dumping syndrome. It'll cause diarrhea like that. So no Jello, no soda, and with banding, what some other things that can happen? You hear a lot about it. Can stuff get stuck in the band? You guys heard about banding? Mm -hmm. You have to be careful. So meat has to be like really ground up. You have to be careful with those stringy meats. Um, even like bread, they can't usually consume bread. So you really have to be careful with the banding, uh, that things don't get stuck in the band because um, it can cause infections. Um, so there's some, typically what they'll have the patient do is go on a diet prior to any uh, bariatric surgery to try to <coughs> lose weight uh, naturally uh, with healthy options. If the patient has hypertension with type two diabetes, and sometimes this will help a lot. And uh, I've seen some successes with bariatric surgery, but there also can be some side effects to you. So again, recovering from illness and uh, very low calorie diets is another type of thing that usually is on 346. It has to be done in doctor's care. Uh, 400 to 800 calories is usually in liquid form. This is usually what they do before surgery um, to try to help get the, some of the weight loss so they can do surgery. Okay. So what are the types of bariatric surgery techniques? And this is on page So what are the types of bariatric surgery techniques? They also call it gastroplasty, reacting on the stomach. You know that most insurances cover that. Yeah, they do. Yeah, there are side effects, though. Oh, I know. Believe me. You're working I'm the clinical setting, right? Okay. You work in a, in a hospital charting. Well, yeah, I mean, but I, I know the side effects because I've had the sleep done. Okay. I mean, and, and if I could go back and do it again, I don't know that I would. Okay, so what's some side effects that you're really um, seeing? You know, okay, you talked about the Atkins diet. Whenever I was on the Atkins diet, that's whenever I spent five days in the hospital because all I, I never ate carbs. No all carbs at all. You got too weak. I um, lost um, 75 pounds. Wow. And, um, but I had the stones in my bowel ducts and I've developed pancreatitis. And then with this, with this surgery, um, you know, I've had my gallbladder removed, but one thing that I really bothers me is that I have acid reflux. Reflux, yeah. And that we just, hear that a lot. Yeah, and I don't under, I, that's something that I've never had before. And, you know, if people, 
now, this is just my opinion, but yeah. people nowadays, you know, you can go into a hospital, somebody, you know, weighs less than Hannah, and, you know, and they will do surgery on them. I mean, and they, you know, six months, six months later. And they, and they nothing have surgery. I know. You I know, really don't think just, they should do no, that for I just anybody. Either. I mean, anybody. it's and dangerous. I, and I went, I went with four, five, four other people, and one of the persons that I went with, I mean, she was maybe a size 12. I mean, you know, she wasn't big no, at there all. There was no reason. Right. right. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, and I'll be the first to tell you that I've gained most of my weight back. If you're, if you're not committed to exercising, Diet, if you think that it's just a um, easy way to lose weight, bull crap. Yeah, yeah, you have to be it, it's right. Committed. I mean, yeah. it's it's still exercise and it's still diet. You know, yeah. my excuse is my father died and I didn't want to do anything after my father died. Yeah. But I mean, I put 35 pounds back on of what I, you know, I mean, I lost quite a bit. But but still, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's not a cure all. Yeah, that's a good and, point. And the thing, and and just the. You know, like you said about the diarrhea uh, and uh, side effects of yeah. the, having the, yeah. the treatment. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of side effects that they don't talk about. Um, I know a dietitian's working with a patient who's been in out of the hospital in McAllister a lot due to complications from her surgery, mm -hmm. and she is so ill now mm -hmm. that um, her life is. And she was a healthy person with prior to the mm -hmm. treatment. So you run a risk there. Oh, you yeah, know, there right. is a, there are risks that they don't always t right. tell you up front. Right. Yeah. But, but you know, yeah. now it's good now, that you're talking about it. Nowadays it's um, nowadays that most insurances pay for Yeah, insurance you know, is promoted even. Right, yeah. they do. They do promote it. But mm -hmm. I also take I also think that um, doctors take advantage of that. They do, because it makes them make money off of it. That's right, yeah, yeah they, they make do. money off of it's it. It's a money maker, yeah. And you know, and don't get me wrong, I mean, of the, of the four other people that I went with, uh -huh. all the other four women are still skinny people. I mean, skinny as well. As, you know, I just... Uh, but there's healthy, this is the thing, what we think is healthy and what actually it's healthy for us you know what I mean you wouldn't believe Our, the, the mental part of what we think is healthy you, and, you wouldn't believe the people that would tell me before how I look sick you know they would never tell me that to my face but you know but now that I've put on some pounds um, they tell me that you know well you actually look normal healthy. you don't look sick anymore and I have seen a lot of people that just really look Ill. Yes. Uh, Mr. Well, Shero, John Shero asked me if I was sick. He sent me in the back and asked uh, me if I was sick one day. You know, and I don't know. There's just some there's just some side effects to it. And sure. and another lady that I went with, she she was told that she would she had rheumatoid arthritis uh, and she was told that it would cure her arthritis and that she would uh, you know, another lady I work with, most, a lot of women that I work with, there's probably 10 of us out there that's had the surgery. And so 10 people with bariatric surgery? Yes, uh -huh. yeah, that have, that have had the sleeve or had bypass. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, they think that it's a cure-all, that it's like close to diabetic. You know, uh -huh. well, they're still, they're still fighting that. They're I still mean, fighting the diabetes. Exactly. Yeah. You yeah. know, the only thing that's going to help you know, don't get me wrong, it yeah. helped me lose weight and I feel and I whenever I look in the mirror in the mirror I, I feel like a better person. But if you don't exercise uh -huh. don't exercise to maintain Exactly. You know. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. good. And malnutrition mm -hmm. and yes, malnourishment I mean, that becomes like, an issue with a lot of patients because you can't really get the calories you need in the nourishment if you're not taking vitamins a lot. Right. I mean you have to yeah. take those vitamins every day. And they have to be oral usually and you can't have very much at a time, right? to dissolve. Yeah, there's side effects with B12 too, mm -hmm. so that's something to know. All right, so let's talk about some other disorders, anorexia, um, self-starvation. Usually there's something involved with uh, this type of disorder eating um, because they have a distorted body image. Sometimes it's due to abuse in the home. It can, so sometimes it's a telltale sign. Uh, athletes sometimes will have ballerinas, gymnasts. We see a lot of that with those type of athletes where they're trying to maintain weight. 
And so they may think that they're heavy when actually they're very thin. And so that one of the telltale signs is cooking large meals but not eating anything. Some of them are big baggy clothes. And uh, again, it's a control factor. Maybe there's a controlling parent or controlling parents in the situation. And it's the only thing they can control is what they eat. We see more women with anorexia nervosa, typically in the teen age where it starts to develop. All right, um, five, three to 10 percent can result in death if they don't get help. Suicide is fairly common. Uh, we talked about heart. The heart is made up of cardiac muscle tissue. So if you're not getting enough calories, the heart muscle cells will be used for energy. The protein will be used from the cells, so the heart will start to shrink. And this can cause heart failure. We can have electrolyte imbalances. It can affect their growth and sexual maturation their bone density with, with ballerinas. Uh, low body fat will prevent them from menstruating and it makes their bone density, uh, bones become very weak because they're not producing the hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And sometimes you'll see it with patients, especially kids with diabetes when they're diagnosed early in childhood. And um, it can actually be a side effect of the diabetes where they can't, they're just regulating um, the hormone. Insulin is a growth hormone, and it may cause them to gain some weight, and they'll, they'll do anorexia to help to, want to get their weight down, okay? Again, warning signs, hiding storing food, hypergymnasia, where they're exercising a lot after a meal, and um, very critical of themselves and others. With this low body weight, they'll also have reduced productions of other neurotransmitters, such as serotonin, and so they may become depressed. All of it's linked together. Amnuria is absence of menstrual cycles, okay? So nutrition therapy, um, you need to increase the food to increase their basal metabolic rate. Two to three pounds per week. And by the way, in a normal weight loss, what are you trying to lose? What's a normal weight loss plan? A pound, of, yeah, a pound or two a week. So now we're trying to put weight on. So we say two to three pounds per week, and you'll have to start slow and then build up into that. So um, adding, making gravies and things. Getting people to eat sometimes with anorexia can be difficult. So um, they need cognitive behavior therapy, usually in service um, with a psychologist can be helpful. And uh, with family therapy too. So support groups may be helpful. And then maybe medications for depression. Bulimia is binge and purge. So they may eat and then they purge. This is one that maybe goes undiagnosed because they may be normal weight, they may be even slightly overweight. And this may develop early on and go through life. Um, I went to high school with a girl and I didn't recognize she had bulimia, but I always thought it was kind of different. She was a cheerleader and she would use laxatives a lot, like a lot, lot. So if you're using laxatives, it acts on the colon, right? And it will cause you to lose water weight, right? But it also can lead to a lot of electrolyte imbalance. So that should have been a telltale sign that she had bulimia. So it's not just vomiting, right? Sometimes black stoops can be used. Also, hypergymnasia is another thing, but usually we say binge and purge. So they're binging, uh, maybe they eat a lot of food and then they go and they vomit and get rid of it. Uh, calluses on the back of the hand are a telltale sign of bulimia. Uh, also, it will erode the acid from the stomach, but chronic vomiting will erode away the teeth, cause demineralization of the teeth, and um, it can affect the teeth. So um, the salivary glands will become very swollen, so you can uh, check the salivary glands. So this one actually is very common. Um, we'll, you'll see both types probably in the healthcare uh, set up. Also, you'll see tears and ulcerations in the esophagus, and then there can, the patient can also develop stomach ulcers with bulimia. So you can see the two have the things in common with the electrolytes imbalance. Um, dental decay can happen with both because demineralization of the teeth with anorexia, sometimes you'll see that, and then their immune system becomes very weak with a low white blood cell count. All right, and again, this is kind of like the hidden life of bulimia. We have a lot of adults who have bulimia that um, you'll never know. And then the binge eating disorder is more common in men. Um, bulimia also with women, and where they're eating but not purging, so binging, not purging. 
So what are the difference between anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa? So what are the differences? And then what are some side effects of both disorders? What are side effects of both disorders? 356. has some information and then also uh, 353, 353. So what are the difference between anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa? So what are the differences between anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, and what are the side effects of both disorders? What are the health conditions with both disorders? So what are the difference between anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa? Okay, and then on um, treatments again for bulimia is a lot like anorexia. Outpatient is usually helpful, getting the family involved. And then just finding triggers, finding out um, what are triggers, what are the emotional things going on that causes the patient to um, eat and then we call it binging and then purging. And then there's eating disorders, um, not other specified, which are mixtures. Um, body image disorders, body image dysmorphia. There's a lot of stuff we need to do in America about that, I think. All right. So what is healthy for one person when we talk about healthy weight? I really think some of those tables need to go to you. I think we should just talk about how we feel. How do we feel? You know, how's our body doing? Is our body healthy? You know, that's the most important thing at all. Uh, female athletes have a Lots of those we talked about, you'll see that with Olympics sometimes. Some of those can have uh, unhealthy habits like binging and purging, anorexia, to maintain weight standards and things. And so all of this can be uh, triggers for all kinds of diseases like um, osteoporosis. So all right, so treatment for underweight. You guys are going to be dealing with patients with infectious diseases, HIV, AIDS, cancer. Um, if Kind of like a patient with anorexia, you want to start feeding them carefully. Uh, there's something called refeeding syndrome, so you have to um, slowly add the calories back into their diet if they're really at a low body weight. Um, patients having um, issues with underweight can lead to issues uh, during pregnancy. We talked about menstrual cycle dysfunctions and then recovering from surgery, and then especially our older adults. So adding things like adding extra calories. One thing is adding powdered milk to things, so you, you can, which adds calories as well as protein. So they do that a lot in the hospitals. So they may add powdered milk to the gravy or add powdered milk to pudding to make it more energy dense. Um, giving the patient granola instead of regular cereal, which is energy dense. Nuts, um, sauces, butter to add calories back in and then reducing the energy. So to gain a pound, you have to increase the intake, 2,700, 3,500 kilocalories, the opposite of what we talked about a while ago. Okay, so now let's go to exercise. You guys have any questions about that? We'll go through the, this one's a pretty fast chapter. 
Alright, so let's get into exercise. Nutrition and sports. So the benefits of exercise is everything, right? Alright, so I want you to give me this is your think time. List um, four benefits of you exercising. You'll see all the things have how it benefits a patient. Give me four things that exercise helps you. How does exercise help you? What are four things that exercise does to help you? What are four things that you like about exercising? And this gives you some ideas if you need some ideas and benefits of exercise. There be four things that exercise does to help you. So if we look at all the things that exercise does, it looks like the magic pill, doesn't it? If we could bottle it, we're like, what? It does all this stuff for you. Let me give you my four things that why I like to exercise. One. It helps my mind, clear my mind. If I'm having any kind of stressful day, it reduces my stress. I sleep better at night, which goes hand in hand. I help to maintain my body weight, so my clothes fit better. I just feel better in my clothes, and I feel better about myself. My posture is even better. And bone mass. I have a family history of osteoporosis. Me exercising every day reduces my risk of osteoporosis. That's just four of the top four, right? So, plus I like to be outside. <laughs> Gets me out, right? So, this is the thing. If you guys aren't exercising, it's the magic pill. It's never too late to start. Get kids out. A lot of kids sit inside all day. They have exercise, like Wii games now, that shows kids playing outdoors on bicycles and playing games. I'm like, what? Just get the kids outside kicking a ball. Don't give them a video, video game. Playing video games is now like Playing video games, yeah, it can be terrible. So get them out, get them moving. And then slowing the aging process. That's like my number five reason. All right, so we need 30 to 60 minutes a day, right? So our, our uh, book says 75 minutes, but we said at least 30 to 60 minutes every day. And then we need strength training activities. So you want to mix up your exercise so that you get different types of exercise. You want to add some variety in there. All right? So we already talked about the benefits of being fit, so you don't have to do that. So characteristics, mode. What are you doing? Are you doing aerobic and anaerobic activities? Uh, resistance. Flexibility exercises. Duration, how long? How often are you doing it? Intensity, how fast are you going at it? Progression, um, how you're speeding it up as you're going over time. And then consistency, are you doing it every week? And then adding a variety, okay? So now I want you guys to plan, if you already are doing an exercise program, I want you to plan an exercise program today that involves all these activities are all these components. Mode, duration, frequency, intensity, progression, consistency, and variety. So tell me what you're going to do or what you're already doing. Huh? Yep, it's your think time. Oh, it's a think time? It's a think time. You're like, whoa, this is writing, isn't it? I'm making you guys work today. You're exercising using your pencil, right? Your arms are in. So tell me, if you're not already doing something, what are you going to do? You're going to create an exercise that includes mode, duration, frequency, intensity, progression, consistency, and variety. So when we get into consistency, when are you going to do it? Yeah, tell me when you're going to do it. Right? So if you're already doing something, you could just write down what you're already doing. If you're not doing something, guess what? This is your time. So tell me what you're going to do. 
You didn't know nutrition's gonna make you work out. Man, I'm putting it on you, aren't I? Yeah, but you know what, though? This class yeah. has been so helpful. Has it? Yes, Good. I really have enjoyed this class. Yeah. Is it your workout plan? Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> lovely. Well, that's a big workout plan. Look at you. So, All do right. you go to the gym in high but you haven't always exercised, right? No. So tell us, Tucker, how did you start exercising? Yeah, what made you want to start exercising? Uh, well, when I started going to the gym, I was like 15. 15. And I was the same height that I am now. Uh -huh. Um, but my I was like my body fat percentage was like 28. 28 percent body fat. Okay. And I just didn't like the way I looked. Yeah. And I mean, it's not that like, uh, not like I got made fun of or like I wasn't supported or anything. Right. But like my big brother and my little brother, they're both really athletic. Um, they've always been, you know, like lean and uh, just like effortlessly athletic looking. And I was never like that. And it's not that I didn't try, not that I didn't try to be like them, it's just like, it just genetically they were gifted with fast metabolism. And, yeah, it happens, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so uh, I just started going to the gym. And when I first started, my brother, he was a football player, and he just like gave me this stuff like they would do. and like in the weight room and stuff and I would watch videos on YouTube and first I just I was doing mainly cardio mm -hmm. and I really didn't know a whole lot about all I knew is that you got on a cardio machine you burn calories uh, and you burn calories you burn fat that's but, right on cardio you do right but I didn't know like all the specifics uh -huh. and then I just started watching more YouTube videos and there's like there's like a whole world of fitness YouTubers out there yeah. that are like all interconnected and um, so then I watched them so that's when I started getting into weight training because I found out you know the more muscle mass you have the more calories you're burning at rest that's right good job um, yeah and then I just started learning about nutrition and just like you know doing my own research and stuff and now my big brother actually comes to me to ask me about stuff and I'm the same height that I was when I was 15, I'm about the same weight, except I'm like 12% less body fat. Great. Did you use bioelectrical impedance to determine your body fat? Uh, yeah, I have a scale mm -hmm. and it just, well the way, the way it is for me uh, is I carry most of my body fat in my legs, my hips. I don't carry a whole lot, like in my upper body, like like a regular man does. Uh. But so my upper body is like leaner than my lower body, uh. and the scale that I have, it just like it sends a little electrical current like through one foot uh. up to your hips, yep. back down through the other leg, and back into the scale. So it only tells me my body fat percentage of my legs, uh -huh. Your lower which, body. which is higher than my upper body because that's where I carry all my fat. It's, just, I, it's, it's not uniform, it's not perfectly spread out. So, but yeah, I did use a bioelectrical impedance to measure. Yeah, yeah. So well, and that's the thing with adipose around, you were talking about men, sort in the middle. Typically, we see that later in line too with men. It doesn't always show up until like men are in their 30s and 40s. Like my husband and your husband. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, around, mm -hmm. around the gut. Mm-hmm. Around the and that's very dangerous, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, very dangerous. All right, so this is just showing you examples. I love that you talked about cardio respiratory fitness. And it's never too late to get older adults. Get them up, get them in strength training flexibility. We used to only do cardio activities with older adults too. And now we're putting them, having them do weight training. Again, increasing that muscle mass will lower your blood sugar, okay? Plus it gives them more strength to be able to do things and the flexibility. Okay, so that's using examples. Um, you can determine your own maximum heart rate. There's a little form it's on page 368. 
It's 220 minus age in years. And you don't want to go above your maximum heart rate. All right, ladies, we're almost finished. All right. So if you have a program, it's good to get started. Um, if you're doing a lot of weights, you need support, don't you, Tucker? It's neat how you use the Internet to find information. That's great. Yeah. And then whatever you're going to do, you need to warm up and cool down. So stretching so you don't hurt yourself. And uh, I had an athletic trainer. She always says, whatever you're getting ready to do, do it slow. So you warm it up and cool it down. Mm -hmm. If you're going to run, start walking. And then end with walking. See how that works? Okay. So these are show other ideas of how you can burn calories and to maintain strength and flexibility. Um, energy sources that we're using, ATP, we all know about ATP. Uh, we don't store much in our cells. We only have enough for about two to four seconds. Phosphocreatine is a quick energy source that your body can use in the muscles to make from ATP. It's for like a quick, short burst of things, like you're going up to shoot hoops or something. Um, some people take it from um, supplements. There's kind of, there, the jury's out on this. Your body can make it, whether this is really helpful to take it from supplements or not. Uh, but your body will make phosphocreatine. Can I ask you mm -hmm. a question on that? Sure, because absolutely. Something that is huge mm -hmm. is like uh, whey protein. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm glad you asked you about whey protein. So do you need excess protein to build muscle? Well, a lot of, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of kids that go to the gym, mm -hmm. my use whey protein, included. they promote yes. it. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, they're on, whatever that mm -hmm. website is, and yeah. you know, you mix it with water, you drink it before you exercise. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you, do you think that that helps Is it you? the whey protein, or is it the, it, It's um, It's all kinds of, they have creatine, they have protein, mm -hmm. it's all that Mixtures. different, different stuff. Yeah, but are you talking about the they, protein, or are you talking about the pre-workout? Because most of the time, the protein, or the whey protein, they do it with milk. They don't do it with all they do with water too. The pre workout drinks I and take things. My protein some just less calories. Some yeah. of those things can be they're hard on your kidneys for one, right? It's a lot of urea. So excessive protein, not so good. Um, kind of what they're saying now, um, specialists I mean in every exercise guru is gonna tell you a different thing, right? Uh, but what nutritionists are saying is you need a blend of carbs and protein because after the exercise um, is when your body can really store the glycogen. It's that glycogen, especially if you're in any kind of athletic event, that gives you the edge. That's what um, Olympic players and sports players are always doing is building glycogen. You do need carbs for source of energy. So those pre-workout drinks that have some carbs in it, and again, if you're if it's protein, your body's going to have to. Uh, it can only convert certain amino acids into glucose. You guys remember that? So some of those amino acids are not going to be converted. It's really hard on the kidney, so you're kind of wasting your money. So what so, about so what about that pre-workout? Like, like, I mean, mm -hmm. doesn't that? I've seen people come. They drink Caffeine. pre. They drink pre-workout before they come to work, and I mean, I've got a girl at work just jitters. You know why? Because it's loaded with caffeine. So they have seen some response with performance for full athletes, not just for weightlifting. Mm -hmm. With caffeine, a little edge, right? But not enough that they recommend it, usually. Now, now some exercise people do say a little bit of caffeine is good, but a lot of that stuff is mixtures of stuff that may not be good for your liver. So you really, because you can sell anything, remember? You can sell anything, and it can be on you. As a supplement, mm -hmm. the sky's the limit, and it can cause liver failure 10 years from now, and then you get sued 10 years from now, right? But you may already be out of business. You see what I'm saying? So they say things like um, chocolate milk or muscle milk, you know, it's milk where you're getting sugar and protein for rebuilding any tears if you're doing a lot of lifting and so that microscopic tearing that goes on. So some, a little protein with carbs, but they really say carb loading is one of the better things to do. Um, doing Gatorade, so you're getting some carbs while you're working out. Um, but some people say phosphocreatine is helpful. Uh, if you remember, you get more ATP from aerobic than you do anaerobic pathways. We talked about that one last week. You store glycogen in your muscles and your liver. And uh, again, that gives you those short bursts of exercise things that you need to do. Depletion and glycogen 
is what we call hitting the wall. So the more glycogen you can store, the better off you are. So what are the different muscle fuels that phosphocreatine, fats, and carbs are used for? And so the, the duration of the events are on page 374, where it talks about when we use these uh, energy sources on page 374. We didn't get to fats yet, but fats are what we burn on the long-term exercise regimes, right? as long as we're bringing, bringing in oxygen. So how are the dis different muscle fuels, the phosphocreatine, fats, and carbs used? So how are the different muscle fuels used in exercise? So phosphocreatine, fats, and carbs. Again, that's on page 374 if you need some help. Yeah, sure. So we're back on the fat thing. So if we're wanting to use fats as a source of energy to lose weight, how long does our exercise go? How long the duration does our exercise need to be? More than yeah, more than 30 minutes. And it has to be aerobic or anaerobic? Aerobic. aerobic. So you better be able to sing, right, or talk. Otherwise, you can only do anaerobic Right, which are only using glucose as a source of energy. We talked about that. So if you want to help patients use the fat stores, they need to do aerobic activities. It needs, typically we say over 30 minutes, then we start burning them. This is what they're saying, the effect of diet on physical endurance. The cool thing about the more you're using the muscles, the more you're work, longer you're working out, uh, the more uh, glycogen your muscles will store, so they become more efficient. Also, the more mitochondria you have in your muscle cells so they become more efficient at using oxygen and using your stores. So the thing is you want a carb load. So as soon as the exercise is over, then you're going to eat the carbs. That's how you carb load. So if you have, um, for example, Todd, you play baseball or basketball. And so do you carb load for a game? You try to. So do you taper your exercise down and increase the carbs right before a game? Yeah, that's typically what you do is you start tapering the exercise down right before a game and eat all the carbs you can eat, right? To try to load up your glycogen stores. So, yeah, you guys are, are y'all doing two a day? No, you're not anymore. Y'all were, right? Yeah. So you need a lot of calories to help to maintain it. Yeah. All right, so main, fat main fuel for low intensity exercises. And that's just showing you how you're using it. We talked about this last week. So you can see the difference between uh, different types of exercise and which type of energy stores you're using. So look at walking, for example. Weightlifting, so you're using fat. Another reason, to go, if you're trying to get a patient to um, use the fat stores is to do those exercises. Right. Protein, minor fuel during exercise. Uh, branch chain amino acids, some of those can have side effects to you that can affect the liver. 
Um, so you'll see on those labels, those exercise supplements say branch chain amino acids. Um, we're, you can use them, the amino acids for gluconeogenesis, we talked about more in that. Uh, eating more protein, that's what we talked about a while ago, whey protein, will not increase the muscle mass, no matter what you say. Genetics plays the biggest role in exercise, okay? So all the benefits of exercise to your body. Increasing cardiac output, your whole vascular system improves, as well as your respiratory system. So atrophy is the opposite of hypertrophy. Hypertrophy, increase in muscle size, atrophy, shrinking. All right, so we talked about what you need to do. Protein needs, if you're a marathon runner, you need more protein. Uh, anywhere from 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilogram of body weight. Uh, fluid intake, weigh in, weigh out. Thirst is a late sign of dehydration. If the patient becomes dehydrated, um, they can have heat stroke. Uh, heat cramps are on page 390, where we're losing too much water, and it actually leads to the cramping. And also, with water, they need electrolytes. So that's why sports drinks are so great. They have the carbs, the electrolytes, the sodium, and they also add potassium. Um, also, if you're, if you're an athlete and you're exercising a lot and you're only drinking water, it can lead to low blood sodium called hyponatremia which also um, can be very dangerous and can lead to death over time if you're drinking too much water. I mean, that's a lot of water. So weighing in and weighing out. So um, two to three hours before, drinking two to three cups. And again, Gatorade is good too because you get the electrolytes with it or something with sodium, a little bit of carbs. Uh, Pre-exercise meal, you don't want anything that's going to cause gassiness and fiber. Right, especially if you're in a marathon runner. So what are the effects of dehydration? Uh, page 390. So what are the effects of dehydration? Page three Alright, so this is just carb intake for carb loading. And uh, sports anemia, sometimes you see this with females and uh, more than males. So when you start exercising, it takes a while because your blood volume is increasing for the red, um, the bone marrow to keep up with producing red blood cells. So when you test them, they may, it may show that they have anemia. So you want to check them again to make sure they don't have iron deficiency anemia, which is due to like an adequate iron in the diet. So sports anemia is a temporary response, okay? Also, if they're vegetarian, they may have iron deficiency anemia. At ergogenic age, there's a whole bunch of them on page 396, 397. A lot of them can be dangerous, like anabolic steroids, growth hormone. All right, let's just see these examples. All right, so let's just show them. All right, now I'm going to show you how to do the calculations. So I'm going to go over here and 